Now, this telescope was originally brought up here and built to study Mars and to study the canals on Mars. Oh, it's okay. Are you excited? Yeah, okay. Good. And the reason why I say canals on Mars was um, when you look at Mars through telescopes that were built there in the you can see some different features on them. It's not just one uniform color, you've got some darker areas and some redder areas. There's differences in composition. Now, for these telescopes, uh, when you map them out, it looks kind of like canals in a way. Kind of. Not really. But when Schiaparelli, that Italian astronomer, was uh, studying Mars and writing up, you know, his notes and his papers about it, he noted these features as canali in Italian, which actually translates to uh, channels. But uh, if you have a bad translation, it can translate to canals. And what do you think of canals? Do you think somebody had to construct them? Right. And back during this time, it wasn't too outrageous to think that people were living on different planets. You see, George Magic and all these things. Um, was it wasn't too weird to think of, you know, things living on other planets. We still think that today just to a kind of different degree. Back then there was like one knowledge like, yeah, there are aliens on Mars. There was, uh, they even thought that there were people living on the sun. I mean, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> that's what I, that was the face I had when I first thought about that too. And it's not that weird at the time, but uh, the more we know, the more, uh, that doesn't seem to fit quite well. But first of all, Lowell wanted to go to study Mars and study these canali uh, a bit more in depth. So, he spent uh, X amount of money building this observatory up here. This telescope was about $10,000 back in the day, which was 1896. That's a lot of money. And this is an older type of telescope. This one is called a refractor. Most telescopes that we use today, like all the ones we were talking about at our research sites, those are reflectors, they use mirrors. Now this one uses lenses in it. And um, after a while, you have to move away from this style of telescopes because the larger you make them, it just gets, it gets pretty intense pretty quickly. So, like this one is a 24 inch lens, or about two feet across. And the telescope is 32 feet long and six tons. So, um, there's, a, there's a few other larger ones in the world. The largest one that they built, maybe a 16-inch one, so a 5-foot lens. And they displayed it at the World's Fair. And that was the only time it was ever used, because if you were trying to use it, it's so heavy the thing will like break under its own weight. So they moved away to uh, reflectors. But for this one, they used the... Uh, this one, this one, we still use it at night. And it's, you know... Almost 117. Now you guys can, you guys all might have to kind of come over here, but we'll, we'll have to do some journeying during this tour. You know, what if, well, let's make it go up there. Okay, what if the eyepiece is up there? Now they did research very differently than they do today. Today, you know, we can save everything to our computer. Back then, most things were done by hand. He would draw all of his observations of Mars in a notebook that he kept. And standing on a ladder for a couple hours during the night, drawing is not very fun. So they created this contraption this to sit up there his chair. and draw what you're looking at. He's Mars you know, watching he's chair. Nice and tea next to you. I don't know, I don't know what else you have. Uh, some chocolate. <laughs> I don't know if they had too much chocolate. Ah, uh, honey. There we go. I don't know if they had too much chocolate back then. Maybe. So, another problem that they had at that time. I'll move the telescope back up there, too. I'm going to do something cool, too, you guys can see. Another problem they had was uh, if you guys can see all these red lights around here, we use these during the evening when you guys come to view because they don't ruin your night vision, but you can still see where you are. Now, if you're observing, and it's, I don't know, 1899. You don't have red lights readily available, you have candles and whatnot. How are you going to move the telescope without ruining your night vision and turning the lights on? What they did to fix that, let's see if I can this. It's a six-ton telescope. And I am not six tons. So, yeah. This is my gym membership for you. <laughs> um, what they did is you guys can see all these different 
knobs that are here on the telescope. Each one does a different function for moving the, the, the telescope different ways. This one right here, if you lock it down, or if you unlock it, you can move it east to west. This one right here, which is smaller, has still has a smooth surface on it, moves it north to south if you unlock it. Uh, the metal one right here changes the amount of light that you can let into the telescope, it's called the aperture. And um, the, each one has a different texture on it. So during, yeah, so during nighttime you can just be like, okay, here's the right ascension, I can move it, but now the object's almost there, but it's kind of up in the other corner. I'll find the one with groups, turn it a bit, do the slow RA, and get it right centered. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, I love this telescope. I like to have the bike chains on here. Super cool. And you can tell that some of these are newer pieces and some of them are older. Like uh, this one, it's clearly older. <laughs> this one's newer. Um, this one right here is actually older than the telescope that it's on. If you read right under here, it has a date of 1894. So this one's about two years older. Um, this one is was added on about 20 years later. It is also the world's largest finder scope in the world. <laughs> it is very large, but it's a great little uh, telescope. Not really good for finding an object, but cool for looking at stuff through it. Now, when this one right here was sent out to the observatory, um, it came delivered and it did not have a uh, lens cap with it. And uh, they couldn't get a lens cap sent out to them, so they had to create one. Had a great lens cap, right? And uh, one of the astronomers who was working here actually found one in his mother's kitchen, right? And it's still there, so check it out. It is a frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> we have it welded on. Uh, it's fallen off a few times. Not, it fell off about 35 years ago. But we keep, it's so cool, and it works so perfectly. <laughs> so I always thought that super cool. It's a nice little lens cap. But, um, so the telescope did take one little vacation. The first year they brought this telescope out here happened to be the year where we had tons and tons and tons of snow. First of all, we'll got that up. He was like, oh, this is a great sight. And I'm not doing any research yet. I just built this telescope, brought it out here. I will be doing the research. So the telescope actually went down to a place in Mexico called Taco Baya about a year, you just like, you know, remove all essences of snow, right? So, uh, and it spent a year down there, and it came back, and it hasn't moved since. So, that was the telescope's only um, <laughs> vacation. <yeah. laughs> this one? Um, I don't know if there was actually a railroad that went down to Takubaya. It was easy enough to send it out here, from uh, the East Coast, this was built over on the East Coast. And you know, you ship it out here on the, on the train. But then how do you get up the hill, right? There's no cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm guessing this is the same setup with Taco Bay. You get, you know, like 20 horses. It's bullets, really where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think six tons. I've actually, I had a conversation with the guy on a month ago about how many horses it actually took. Because I can't find it anywhere in the records here. I've asked everybody who's worked here for you to have no idea how many horses it was. But uh, imagine carrying a six ton telescope up a hill. Right? 20 seems like a good number, right? I'm just kind of guesstimating what 20. I guess it depends on the types of horses. If you have ponies, maybe get 50 of them. Um, this was designed by Alvin Clark and Sons, so that's why it's called the Clark Telescope. And they were like the world's foremost telescope makers at the time. Which, they lived up to it, I mean, the telescope is still perfect. The lenses are even amazing. Although the lenses were, um, came from uh, another place over in uh, North Carolina. So, from a guy who's actually just his own, he's an astronomer, and he grounded the lenses himself. Is there a big demand for telescopes? Um, enough so that they could make, you know, a good living off of it. But, uh, at, the t at the same time, you know, 1800s, not a lot of people um, had like $10,000 just to be like, oh my telescope. So, but there were uh, a good amount of, I mean, they made smaller ones than this one. Um, so, there was enough of a demand that they could sustain a good business model. So, we can't do a certain size to get a good view of Mars? Um, this one, I said, for the research that Percival Lowell wanted to do, 
do, it had to be a certain size. And when you look at Mars through this one on a really good night, Mars actually has ice caps on it. Um, you can see the ice caps really well. You can even see the composition change on Mars, which is, one time, one night we saw clouds. That was cool. Then one night we looked at like, where's all the composition? You can't see any of the changes over the feature. And we're like, oh, it's a dust storm! Because Mars will get these uh, amazing dust storms every once in a while. Um, really when it's going from summer to winter. And dust storms cover the entire planet. So if you guys like dust storms, you know what to do. How would the quality of the objective rate by today's standards? Objective rates? The, no, how, how the main um, lens in the, at the top, the 24 inch guy? Uh, well, the lenses are essentially as good as they were the day that they were bought out here. So they're really great lenses. I mean, compared to other refractors. I mean, compared to a lens that would be could be made today. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever actually done a study on that. Um, I'm just going to say this one's better, out of bias. <laughs> But uh, I don't actually know. Um, I guess it depends. Today's are probably a bit better just because of the like, increase in technology. But also, most of the lenses that are made for uh, refractors today, yeah, they're much smaller. You know, they could be like that big at most. Most of them are made from like different telescope manufacturers. And um, there's, yeah, there's a great reason why they moved away from these. Mirrors actually produce a much clearer image. Like if you guys uh, look at Saturn through this one, you'll get a great image of it. You can see Saturn. If it's a really good night, you can see the Cassini division between the rings. On average, we see uh, four to five moons around Saturn every night, which isn't bad. Saturn has a little over six moons. Four to five, we'll take it, you know? But then if you go look at a smaller telescope with a mirror, it'll be a little bit crisper. It'll be much farther away, depending on what telescope you look at. I actually looked at uh, the moon once on a telescope that went 800 magnification. It was, it was weird. It was so weird. It was kind of like you lived on the moon and you woke up one day and was like, what's the matter with it? It was like being on the moon. It was really weird. But, um, yeah, although I'd say mine it wasn't that cool. Like, you couldn't really see any of the craters or mountains. Or... I am very much digressing. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Um, so this tells you, let's talk about the dome really quickly. So the dome has gone through a lot of different uh, styles. The actual dome itself, like the, the wooden part, that part is the original. And when they first brought this telescope out here, they had like a makeshift dome to protect the telescope. But it wasn't doing the job they really wanted it to do. Um, I'm going to call a quick time out. Does anybody want to like sit down around here? I can move the room. Okay. Did you guys take a look at that if you want? Um, yeah. I'm going to hook these a bit too. Four Chevy um, they would truck be tires. Out by hand and clean them that way. Great. And we're all now like with original hub tops. <laughs> because what if we take them out and break them? They're faceless. So we had to create a new way to uh, clean them. Now, you guys let me find right there. So what we do? Okay. What we do? We take the telescope. We push it all the way up here. Oh, cool. Yeah. I have had the telescope caught on a rope before. Uh, that's another story. That's pretty cool. 
And so we put the telescope there, and you can see how the shiner doors get a little platform. We can clean the outside from there, but we still like to clean the inside. Because um, there's stuff that gets in there. And what we do, if you can see this black area on the end of the telescope, that actually comes off. And the telescope's hollow inside. I don't. Um, but uh, one of uh, our specialists here, Ralph Mai, does. Really? And Ralph Mai's about my size. So, uh, but he shimmies all the way up to the top, cleans it inside himself, and he's like, yeah. He's a brain. really, I don't know what they're doing about it. But, uh, yeah, he's like a wizard with a fire telescope. And um, a bleak comparator, which you guys will see here in a little bit when we go down to our Zenit Museum. We uh, stopped working last summer. This is old, you know. And really what happened was the gears got broke, like wound down, so we couldn't click it back and forth anymore. He specially hand created new gears on his own to put back in there. Because not many people make specialized parts for these bleak comparators in the 1900s. But, uh, yeah. You guys have any questions right now? Or anything? I can really go over anything. We can do some fun pictures. 